want to welcome Laura Farrer, the founder of Distributed Consulting and the Remote Work Association. A global thought leader on the topic of remote work, Laura collaborates with the world's leading business and governments to eliminate virtual work discrimination, increase remote job accessibility, and train distributed leaders. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please use Sligo. We'll have the link passing in the chat and we'll address them in the end of Laura's lecture. Hi, Laura. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much, Laura, for being here. So I have a controversial question for you, if you don't mind. Of course, I'm an open book. <laughs> so, Laura, do you think that pineapple goes on pizza? Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I know that Europe <laughs> Europeans don't agree, but I'm an American and I'm okay. sacrilegious. We have a homemade pizza in a movie night every single Friday in my family and at least half of the, the pineapple, at least half of the pizza have pineapple. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, yes, I'm, as a European, I'm more uh, kind of M or cheese kind of pizza, you know. So for me, a pineapple is a no, but no judgment here, Laura. Thank you for your... I appreciate that this is a safe place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a safe place. You can, you can give us your answer. So, Laura, I want to know all about optimizing virtual organization infrastructure. The stage is yours. Thank you so much. Well, I'm thrilled to be talking about this today because um, this is such an important and relevant conversation. This is something that we have focused on for years here at Distribute Consulting, um, but now it's a very, very relevant and critical conversation for everybody to have access to um, because there is a very, very big difference between just allowing somebody to work remotely, you know, go home with a laptop, ta-da, you're, you're a remote worker, right? There's a big difference between that and actually integrating remote work into your organization. And so you hear a lot of statistics that say like, oh, you can save, you know, 11 and 20,000 US dollars per year um, for if your, your organization converts over to remote or um, there is, there's all these benefits of like higher employee retention and higher productivity. Um, however, you may not be seeing any of those if you don't make the proper implementation. If you're not truly adopting remote work, then you're not ever going to see those, those benefits. In fact, it can probably hurt your company more than help it. So that's what we're discussing today um, as managers, as leaders, and just as remote workers in general. What is the difference between just changing your workplace and actually changing your organization to be comprehensively remote friendly? So I'm going to share my screen. I do have some slides for us today um, to just help uh, move the conversation along, give you something to look at other than my face. Um, and then uh, please be tracking your, your uh, questions. I'm happy to answer as much or as little as you, uh, um, as you want to know, but we're, we are going to get pretty pretty deep here. Um, and as an introduction to this topic and my backstory with this topic, uh, like Andrea said, uh, Distribute Consulting is currently the world's only consulting firm that specializes exclusively in remote work. So this was a pretty small business, small conversation four months ago. Now it's a very big business, a very big conversation. So we are here to help um, and we are here to make sure that everybody has access to this information, which, which is very, very rare. And it is the organizational development and behavior of distributed teams. So Without further ado, let's jump into it. Um, like I said, this is who we are. This is Distribute Consulting. Um, we do specialize in this change management, the optimization process. However, we also do a lot of other things like Andrea mentioned. Um, we do infrastructure strategy and design. So this is where we work with organizations um, like nonprofit organizations, corporations, governments on uh, solving a problem. So they come to us and they say, we have a problem that we need to solve. We know that remote work plays into this. What should we do? And so that is really strategic, high level thinking. We absolutely love those contracts um, and we can design infrastructures for, for that solution. 
We also do a lot of content and events. Um, this has been a growing branch of our business in the past six months that was very minimal before, but now um, there are so many organizations that need to know how to sell to a remote work audience. They need to be able to pivot their product and their messaging to match the language and needs of a distributed team. And so this is um, a, a, a service that we've been honored to serve and to provide for large brands um, like Zoom and Microsoft and Panasonic and, and really um, great, great brands to help them embrace this uh, new dynamic of work as well. Uh, okay, so next, um, this is not directly relevant to the um, to the presentation itself. However, it's a very, very <laughs> critical baseline that we need to set to get everybody on the same page about remote work. You've probably heard this once or twice in previous um, presentations, but just in case you didn't participate in those other speeches, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page about remote work and the state of remote work in our world. Um, remote work is not new. <laughs> Please just, that's the short version of this. A lot of people think that this is a very new, um, very exclusive type of work that is irrelevant to them and th to their industry. And so that creates a lot of hesitation as they're looking to adopt remote work because they think, oh, wait a second, this isn't you know, this is new, this is, there's too much risk involved, and, you know, what if it doesn't work long term? So it's really important that we all understand that remote work has been happening for over a half of a century. Um, it's been growing exponentially since then because the technology that enables telecommuting has been made more mobile and more affordable over time. So that's why we've seen such a flourishing of workforce and workplace mobility in the past couple of years. Um, and we knew that 2020 was going to be a big year for remote work. All of my presentations and speeches in um, the fourth quarter of 2019 were was saying exactly that. It's going to be a big year. Buckle up. Um, we know that you know something's going to happen that's going to just make remote work boom. However, um, as you can imagine, we had no idea that it was going to be as big as it is. Um, we wish that it was under better circumstances. We wish that it could have been a much more positive experience that brought this to light. However, we are honored that remote work was in a place and the industry was in a place that it could support scaled growth. So, um, so yeah, so remote work has been happening for a while. We've got some great learnings and education from those 50 years and that we can apply to our learnings now to make sure that it's successful long-term. Um, as a quick snapshot of where we're at right now, 70% uh, of the workforce could work remotely and is estimated to have been working remotely at least one to two times a week during the coronavirus pandemic. 70%, this is not a U.S. statistic, this is a global statistic, 70% of the workforce could work remotely. That is an astronomically massive massive number. Um, and so we really need to understand what remote work is and how to embrace it. That's been the big shift in the conversation about virtual jobs in the past uh, three months is that previously it was very much a conversation about if is this viable for our company? Is this realistic for our team? Um, is this realistic for my for my personal lifestyle? There was a whole bunch of you know case for change conversations. However, now it's a matter of it's here, it's here to stay. How are we going to leverage it? It's a whole new conversation about how instead of if. So um, the 70% number is extreme, and obviously it came from extreme circumstances. So what is it going to look like long term? Um, we know, as of right now, the data is, is pointing to the fact that at least 20% of enterprise employees will never go back to an office. Now, this is an incredible level of growth because at the beginning of this year, it was 3%. 3% of the workforce was permanently remote, now 20%. And that number is growing every single week. Um, in fact, this week, it's estimated that I can confidently release that that number is 30%. So it's growing exponentially by the day, by the week. This is a conversation that we need to know about. All right. So, so that we can uh, do that so that we can know about this, let's start getting into the content of the presentation, um, which is 
what makes or breaks the success of a virtual organization. We've all gone remote. We are now all in that position where we've changed our workplace um, and we have changed our workplace permanently. Whether we go back to the office or we stay at home, our workplaces have forever changed. They will never be the same again. So we need to understand what the difference is. Um, this is a, a quote from one of my recent Forbes articles that really is, um, summarizes the topic of what we're discussing today that says there is a difference between being at home during work hours and working remotely in a way that maintains or enhances business operations. That's exactly what we're discussing and that's the, exactly the information that I want to equip you with. So here at Distribute Consulting, when we are identifying the needs of a client, um, frankly, we don't listen to them very much. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds like a terrible thing to say. However, um, most of the time, our clients are coming to us with very vague information. They're saying, uh, we want to do better, or this is a new model for us. We, we want to learn more. Um, and it's just very, very broad, broad information. However, the cruel irony of going remote is that you don't know what you don't know. This is exactly why we saw the infamous retractions of, um, of banks and companies like IBM and Yahoo that sent their entire workforce remote and then retracted them all because they didn't understand what is the difference between what's happening now and what's what needs to happen in the future. And they didn't ever make this change management process uh, accurately or specifically. So they just said, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll give some training to the workforce and then that's it. We'll be remote, right? No, that is not a change management process. That is a, a training course. Um, so we, when we get connected with a client, we conduct what is called a virtual health analysis. And that's where we uh, evaluate, very carefully analyze these six topics in the infrastructure and the operations of our, our clients' businesses. And that's where we're looking for very, very specific risks and very, very specific um, changes that need to be made in order for remote work to be sustainable in an organization, not just allowed, but truly adopted. So I'm, that's the, the presentation today is I'm going to walk you through what these six pillars are, what we look for as consultants, and what you need to be aware of in order to make this change from allowing to adopting. So let's start with workforce. This is where we need to see that um, the, well, I'll just read it. The support, recruiting, and training of staff encourages autonomy. This is a massive change. It doesn't seem like it's very earth shattering, but it is. So much of our virtual, uh, or I'm sorry, our the operations of our businesses is physical. It is a derivative of the industrial revolution where we had physical equipment, physical products, physical output, physical workflows, um, physical workers, physical workspaces. Everything was physical. Like that was the central, that was the birth of centralized workspaces. Now what we have is we have virtual everything. We have virtual workflows, we have virtual processes, we have virtual output, we have uh, virtual workplaces, but we're still operating in this physical space, this physical workplace, this physical management strategies. And so you'll hear me refer to this difference between physical and virtual throughout the presentation. That's what we're talking about is how do we update everything to be virtual um, so that we're not, we don't have this dichotomy between physical workspaces, physical management strategies and, um, and virtual workplace. And this is, is at the core of each individual. This is the role that each individual needs to play is they need to be a self manager because you don't have everybody around you. You don't have that physical accessibility to the people that you work with. So you've got to create a virtual workforce. You need to be able that, um, to ensure that they 
are trained to be ver- uh, to be self managers that they uh, have ability to connect with each other um, as virtual workers. You need to be training them on the skills that are unique to remote work, and you need to be screening for those skills all the way from the beginning in your talent acquisition, hiring, and onboarding funnels. Those all need to be updated for remote work. So again, it's not just changing the workplace; it's really changing who we are as professionals. The next is workplace. This is another jump that we need to make. We, we are used to physical environments where we can see people. We can hear phones ringing. We have tabs on each other. We, we commute to that place together every single day. So much of just who we are as business people is based on this, this standard of a physical workplace. And we need to change that. So I like to say that physical workplaces are built with uh, you know, file folders and bricks and HVAC systems. Um, but physical, or I'm sorry, virtual workplaces are built with software and processes. So it's really essential that we ta- have this conversation about workplace. Have you made that jump into a workplace, um, a, a literal, tangible workplace that is digital instead of physical, Um, where if we think of an office as a place where everybody goes to collaborate, share information and get work done, then it can easily be virtual. And that's what we help with. We help with um, identifying, okay, what is your return to work plan? Um, The the whole conversation about your real estate, what is that going to look like in the future? Are people going to keep coming to the office on a part-time basis? Not so much. Um, How are you going to be implementing health and safety regulations in home offices and co-working spaces? Um, What is the equipment that is needed for each worker to be able to access the office, the the virtual office? Um, Are you going to provide a a co-working stipend? Um, You know, what does everybody's workspace, their physical workspace look like in this new, in this new normal? Next is infrastructure. This is the actual virtual side of that workplace. So we all need physical workspaces, and this is the virtual workspace. Um, So this is where we talk about software and processes. Like I mentioned, um, we talk about project management. So what tools are you using? How do people report on their productivity? How are you tracking their productivity? Um, How are people staying in touch with each other? What are the expectations there? When do you send a Slack message versus an email message? Um, How is everybody staying safe online? Um, All of that information needs to be discussed in order to create this new infrastructure for your virtual business. Next is culture. This is a question that I get probably on a daily basis. Um, How in the world are we going to convert our culture to be virtual? That's not even possible because, you know, we have these great retreats and we get together in the break room for birthday parties like that. There's no way that we can show recognition to somebody if we're not together. This is where I always have to take a step back and say um, to remind everybody that culture is not activities. Culture is the personality of your team. And those activities that we have are a manifestation of our culture. It's a channel in which we express our culture, but it's not the culture itself. Um, The culture is a personality that people really connect with and identify with. It's a shared cause, a shared mission. And the good news about that is that a a mission, a vision is completely independent of location. Um, And so are your people. So is the connection to that culture. Uh, It is 100% possible and very common to feel completely disconnected and isolated when you're sitting five feet away from somebody. Um, So we need to really make sure that our culture, that our people feel connected to their team members and to that mission and vision regardless of where they are, that we're preventing that isolation that has nothing to do with proximity. It's about how are they feeling trusted and engaged and valued as an individual team member. So to do that, we really integrate the culture of your company, the mission, the vision, the values in directly into the workflows um, so that they are experienced regardless of location. We also talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is a very hot topic right now. Um, And this is 
a, a topic that I wish we could all just be shouting for the rooftops because we see 40 percent higher diversity in distributed teams than we do in office teams because of the proximity. Um, the the um, the output is measured very equally and everybody has equal access to work. And so we're taking away discriminatory factors like race and gender and age and uh, family status. All of those are eliminated in distributed teams that are running effectively. Um, so that also leans into international cultural awareness. Um, I just had a great meeting with my staff yesterday on um, introducing the different cultures that we live in and what the norms are that we need to be aware of so that we're we're connecting with all of the the cultures um very empathetically and that was a fun conversation because guess what we live in uh, on four different continents um we all speak different languages and it was a really great way to say this is what i need to in order to be heard this is a very com uh, common conversation in distributed teams because we're distributed we're not all living in the same city um, we also talk about trust. This is, again, nobody's going to feel trusted and, or <laughs> trusted, that's repetitive. Nobody's going to feel engaged and valued and appreciated as a team member unless they feel trusted. So we're going to teach you how to create that sense of trust and engagement in distributed teams. Um, and then also interpersonal relationship building. How do you get to know people over uh, a screen, right? Like everybody's really worried about that. Like, oh, I'm not going to bump into them at the water cooler. I'm not going to bump into them in the hallway. Is it really going to be possible for me to get to know them? Uh, the good news here is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, how are you going to get to know somebody in an office? Well, you're going to walk up to them and say, hi, my name's Laurel. I haven't met you yet. Um, I'd love to grab a coffee with you sometime. It's the exact same thing in remote work. It's just different channels. So if there's somebody on my team that I haven't met, met yet, I send them a message and say, hi, my name's Laurel. I haven't met you yet. I'd love to catch up with you sometime and have a, a quick coffee break. And we do, and we get to know each other and it's a great relationship. So everything about remote work, the big spoiler alert is that it's still just work. <laughs> we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, people are still people. We're just changing the channels. We're changing the places in which all of these interactions and objectives are happening. Next is management. This is the number one barrier to success in remote work adoption. I'm going to be very, very clear about that. Sometimes I sugarcoat it and I say, well, this is one of the reasons. Um, after three months of repeating myself and, and doing a much more intense level of consulting, I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. Um, management is the number one barrier. And we that comes from both sides, like I mentioned. Each individual worker needs to be empowered to be autonomous, to be that self-manager. But then that also means that the managers need to be trained on what this new type of management is. How do you empower your workers more? How do you give the space for more autonomy? How do you uh, track productivity and reporting? without being able to see somebody working? Um, what does virtual collaboration look like? How are you going to be making the most out of virtual meetings? Um, how do you embrace asynchronous communication? This is a totally new style of management. It is just good management. It's not exclusive to remote work and virtual collaboration. Like there is no situation in which empowering your employees to be more autonomous is not a good thing. So even if you all go back to the office, this is still just good management period. However, in virtual collaboration, it's absolutely essential. And if you are continuing to manage your workers in the way that you were in the office, you are leading your, your uh, company down a path of risk and danger. So please, if if you only take one step towards uh, the adoption of remote work, make sure that you're investing in leadership training that that is uh, exclusively and specifically designed for virtual leaders. Next in is compliance. Uh, there are um, I'm going to say about 99% of remote workers are working completely illegally. Um, so if you'd like to, to learn more about this in detail, you can read one of my Forbes articles that's titled, Is Remote Work Illegal? Um, and that kind of walks you through this on, on a case-by-case -case basis. But the short version is that when we're not updating um, 
uh, employment contracts. Rem we're not creating a remote work policy. We're not um, being transparent about licensure and regulations in um, each local country or county. And when we're ignoring all of that and just sending somebody home with a laptop, we are putting our our company at immense liability risk. So we really need to make sure that we are updating our companies for this type of, of work and so that we're not going to be um, creating a much bigger problem for ourselves down the road. All right, so those are the six pillars that we evaluate and that we're looking at. So during that virtual health analysis, um, that's what we as experts and consultants are looking for. Do you have any red flags in any of those areas that you may not see? Um, after that, we initiate our change management process. And this is a four-step process um, that is tried and true from my 15 years of uh, taking companies from physical to virtual, um, as well as hundreds of employees. So this is, or I'm sorry, not employees, uh, clients. Um, so this is our four-step process. Like I said, we start with that analysis. That is, um, that can be very casual just during a discovery call, or it can be extremely uh, comprehensive where we're conducting um, 360 surveys. But if whether we're doing it or you're doing it, you really need to be honest with yourself and um, make the space for this analysis to be happening and not just jump to the, the conclusion and the assumption that, ta-da, everybody's not in the office, therefore we must be remote. Um, you need to take the time to open up the operations of your company and really go through it with a fine tooth comb and say, is this working? Is this compatible? Is this necessary for the operations of um, our new virtual organization? Next is resources. This is where the infrastructure is created that we discussed earlier. So um, we're building that toolkit of software that's going to create that virtual workplace. We're defining what all of the processes are um, and charters are for using those tools. Who are, is using which tools? Um, what tools are the most essential? Which ones are non-essential? Um, how what is the, the workflow for using these tools? Which one do you use first? Which one do you use last? Um, and articulating and recording all of that. Next is training. And this is where we uh, jump in to uh, that education piece that I discussed and that is so important. Um, leadership training as well as workforce training. What is everybody's new role in making this virtual workplace work? And then finally, impact. This is where you create your not only a case for change, but a case for continuation. This is where you're doing ROI calculations and saying, how is this going to be benefiting our company long term? How much money should we be saving? What are the metrics of success that we can be watching and evaluating um, on a regular basis to understand if we're actually doing well as a virtual organization or we're not doing well, what are those benchmarks? Um, because it, again, it's not just, well, we're at home, I guess it's working. There's so much more complexity to that and you need to be able to have um, criteria that you're evaluating regularly in order to, to measure. So um, just to, to recap and look at the deliverables that, you, what again, whether we're doing it here at Distribute Consulting um, or you're doing it internally, these are the deliverables and the results that you need to be seeing at each step. So the first one is um, you need to be analyzing your remote work policy or creating one if you don't have one already. And you need to be identifying the risks that um, your company might be in danger of when we shift the conversation from allowing to adopting. What is preventing long-term sustainability of remote work in your organization? The next is tools and processes. So you need to actually build a virtual workplace. And so that is identifying your software stack, and then um, creating those workflows and processes um, for, and in an information management system like a handbook or um, an, in, uh, an internal database of some kind, but really recording what that is. And that's part of operational resources is how does everybody access their work, their office from 
a completely irrelevant location, right? Like whether they're at home, they're in the airport, they're at a client's office, they're in HQ office, regardless of where they are, how do we make work location irrelevant? Next is the training. So like I mentioned, we're gonna be focusing on worker certification. We're also gonna be talking about leadership training. Both have the objective of how do we empower more autonomy in our teams. And then finally, we're talking about ROI calculations. What financial benefits can you expect to see from this change? And what are those success metrics? How do you know that remote work is working in your company? All right, last but not least is measurement. What metrics indicate a successful optimization? This is part of that fourth step, right? Like how do you know if it's working? How do you know if um, the change that you've just gone through as a company is sustainable? Should you go back to the office? Should you not? How do you know? Um, well, the, the, um, I mentioned this in the very, very beginning, but when we see remote work optimized in a company, you're going to see very poignant and significant benefits coming uh, out of it. So you're going to see higher productivity and output. So 35 to 40% is average um, or 4.4% output. I mean, those are incredible numbers if you think about it. Um, but if people aren't equipped and they're not trained in order to do this new style of work, this new model of work, then you're actually going to see productivity go down or stay stagnant. So we want to see productivity increase. And that means we need to identify where is the disconnection? What do they not have in order to stay productive? Um, next is overhead costs. Uh, because your productivity is going up and your um, overhead, well, never mind. I'll just say this, <laughs> your overhead costs are going to go down. And this is this doesn't take a genius to figure out, right? You're going to be spending less on real estate, less on physical equipment. Um, you don't have expenses like um, toilet paper <laughs> and paper clips and copiers. Um, your overhead costs are going to go down, even with the increase um, of providing equipment and uh, maybe internet connections and home office stipends for all of your employees. That's a very small price to pay in comparison to the uh, overhead expenses that you used to have. And then last but not least is engagement and retention. Um, the reasons that people have to stop working or to quit from a job, um, such as discrimination or relocation of a spouse or needing to care for a loved one, those are eliminated um, when their job is, is flexible and their workplace is flexible. So we see 41% lower absenteeism and a 12% reduction in turnover. Um, those are incredibly beneficial rewards for any organization of any size. So if you are not seeing these benefits in your organization so far, then it probably is a good idea to speak to a consultant so that we can help you optimize your workforce so that you are seeing these benefits. Um, and then m none of my presentations are complete without uh, this conversation, which is the socioeconomic benefits. Yes, I'm a, an a former operations manager and I am a consultant now and I get very, very focused on the operations of businesses and optimizing your workforce. However, my true passion and the, the big message that I want to share with the world is how much remote work can help not just our workers and not just our businesses, but our entire communities and more than that, our global economy. This is an entire presentation by itself, um, and I'm happy to discuss this with anybody one on one. But the real, um, the big picture here is that when we make these changes to our organizations, we are impacting the lives of so many people. We're seeing unemployment rates go down because jobs are mobile. People don't have to move to urban environments to find a good job. We can take jobs to the people. So economic development and un uh, rural unemployment rates are able to be drastically reduced. Um, diversity in both communities and in the workplace is, is forever changed because of the, the productivity tracking methods that we have. Um, the environment, this is, uh, I'm not sure how many of you saw it, but we there was a beautiful article, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, um, about how the Himalayan mountains were seen by um, a local community for the first time be, during now during COVID because the um, 
the air pollution was reduced so drastically while everybody was shut down. And that is a very memorable and poignant example, but it's, it's a, it's proof that our, the environmental sustainability is impacted so much by distributed companies. Um, there's lower energy usage, there's lower fuel usage, um, just overall our carbon footprints are smaller. And then finally, uh, recovery, recovery of economies, recovery of communities is impacted because of the business continuity of distributed companies. And we're witnessing that right now. Our economy is in danger, but if we can get as many companies as possible to be able to maintain business operations, um, even while during uh, during natural disasters or um, or health disasters like we've been experiencing, then our economy can continue to operate. Our economy can stay strong regardless of this massive lifestyle change. So that's my my message to everybody is that remote work literally has the the power to change lives of people of businesses and of communities. So if you're ready to um, take the next steps and to really optimize this and, and unlock the power of remote work in your organization, here are three very, very small next steps that you can take um, to get the process started. So the first thing that you need to do is streamline your channels. Um, make remember how I said that virtual infrastructures, virtual offices are software. And if people, if everyone's using different software and nobody's aligned in, in an, a digital location, you're, it's the physical equip, uh, equivalent of like sending your workers to different offices all over the world to get the same project done. And that's, not going to help anybody. So streamline your channels and make sure that everybody's working in the same places. The second is upskilling your workforce. Like I said, I can't emphasize this enough. Get training, get training for your leadership, get training for your workforce as quickly as possible. Uh, remote work is different. Um, it's not a big difference, but it is a very, very um, specific difference that needs to be trained on. And then if you don't already have a remote work policy, please get a policy. This is very, very important for your compliance and security. Get a policy. Um, and not only does it keep your business safe, but it also sets uh, expectations of performance for you and your offsite workers so that everybody understands exactly how to make this work. And this prevents not only, uh, you know, breaches, um, but also it sets expectations, so it prevents miscommunications that often snowball into big problems, which then snowball into retractions. And that's it. Um, again, I'll, I'll just uh, reinforce this quote that I just said, that flexible work arrangements have the power to change the lives of people, of companies, and communities. I really hope that you see this, um, this change that we've all gone through as an opportunity for, for you and for your teammates, that it's not something that you feel forced into or nervous about, but this is really the next level of, of your company. Um, here's my contact information. Um, please screenshot it or write it down. I'm happy to answer any questions. We'll do a Q&A right now um, here in this event. But if you'd like to contact me directly for um, more sensitive questions, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, LinkedIn is the, the best place to, to find me. So Andrea, you ready for uh, Q&A? Of course, Laura. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Just, just to say it was a great talk. Uh, so the first question, Laura, is how can you as employee help your management team understand that they cannot treat distributed working like simply working from home like you are in the office? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, um, the rule of thumb in remote work is that over communication is just communication. Um, so unfortunately, the first answer that I'm going to give you is talk to them. Um, sit down, schedule a conversation and say, I need to talk to you about something. Um, I feel like this isn't working or there's a gap or just voice your concern. If you don't, um, if you don't have the impact that you're hoping to have with your, your boss or supervisor during that conversation, contact me <laughs> and I can come in and be the bad guy for you. Um, and uh, we can really have a, a very serious conversation with your boss. Um, however, I'll also say that a big mistake that many people make when they're they're talking to their supervisor about 
remote work in general, is that they're talking about the personal impact of remote work. They're saying that um, this is good for me and for my lifestyle and I'm happier and blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's good for you as an individual. However, managers represent an organization. And so if you are asking them to make a business decision, um, then you need to speak in business language, not in personal language. So don't be talking about how it's helping you. Talk about how it's going to help the business in order to make this change effectively. So talk about those points that I mentioned of um, the higher productivity, the higher output, um, the higher retention, uh, the lower overhead costs. Speak in that language and they'll listen to it more. Great. And another question, uh, how much time do your clients usually take to go through the process of moving to working as a distributed team? Mm, this is a good question um, because prior to COVID, <laughs> we were like, we need a, a minimum of six weeks to, to work with everybody. Um, and now we are just, we are helping in any way that people need to be helped. And so we can walk clients through the, the process and like give them a bunch of, of tools and equipment and knowledge um, that they need to implement the, it themselves. And um, that can be, you know, like a two hour meeting. Um, we can help people permanently. So we're placing heads of remote directly into the organizations of our clients so that they have essentially an in-house expert and an in-house consultant to help them permanently, you know, no matter which way they need to pivot. Um, the, the short answer is there is no answer. It can be as, as small or as long as, as you'd like. Um, the average would be four to six weeks. That would be what we, we highly recommend. Okay. Uh, do you think that distributed teams and remote work can really influence diversity in a meaningful way? Isn't there a more deep subject in our society? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a, deep, a much deeper topic. Um, and it, in fact, it's such a deep topic that this is an entirely different conversation, right? Like this is a conversation that um, can be its own presentation. And we can talk about this for an hour or two by itself. And we should, each organization should. Um, the short answer is that because of how we in distributed teams, how we operate and how we, um, we measure productivity, then our workforces are more equal. And this is not just a theory. I mean, we have statistics and, and um, case studies to prove that diversity and inclusion is increased in in distributed teams. But then again, if you step outside of that, just even outside of the company, and you think about this on a, on a bigger scale, um, a lot of what we're doing right now in, in this post-COVID world is we're doing a lot of consulting on education. And so when you think about that, when you think about how classrooms can change um, when incorporating virtual operations, and the, what it means is that it completely removes geographic boundaries, right? Just like our businesses. But then you think about that on a bigger scale. When we're removing geographic boundaries of schools, that means that we don't have poor schools and rich schools anymore. It means that all children are getting equal access to the same education and resources. Think about how much that changes the world. I mean, it, it's massive. So yes, the, the short answer is absolutely. Um, if For whoever asked this question, please contact me directly and I can send you some recordings and uh, resources that, that explain this in more detail. Um, but yes, this does have the power to change a lot of discrimination in our world. Um, urban rural divide and accessibility to work and uh, discrimination in the workplace. It is, it's a huge resource. Uh, regarding success metrics, what's the one metric you think every company should take into account? Um, start with productivity. That's the, an easy one to, to measure. And most of the time, companies already have some type of, of output measurement in place. And so you don't need to, to reconstruct, um, you know, you don't need to recreate the wheel is what I'm saying. So um, start with productivity and make sure that uh, operations are, are being maintained. Um, and then also that gives you the, the first step that you need to start measuring true productivity, which is not just are people in the office um, and do they look busy, but are they actually 
producing output. So when you shift productivity measurement away from um, away from that that sensory supervision that we're used to in the office, and you move over to results based tracking, so you're you're measuring um, accomplishment instead of activity, then that is really what unlocks the, the unique potential of virtual collaboration. The last question, Laurel, is uh, you mentioned that you are working way more now. Do you feel companies are really asking for help in the long run or will they go back to the old ways ASAP? Um, so I'll be completely honest. I thought that it was going to be the latter. I, I was fully prepared for um, the world to all go remote and then go back to their offices and then say, okay, what are we going to do in the long term? However, <laughs> um, it, it has not been that way because uh, most of this conversation is actually being driven by the chief financial officers because they are the ones that are seeing those benefits immediately and they're saying, whoa, our expenses are going way down, our productivity is going up, our satisfaction is going up, like we need to pay attention to this. And so I was caught off guard just as much as anybody else about the fact that um, that 20 to 30% number that I mentioned in the beginning, those are people that went remote and will never go back to the office. I was shocked by that. I really thought that it was going to be go back and then uh, eventually go remote. So um, yeah, it, it's happening. Like the, the, the scale is, is tipping and we do need to be prepared for this as the new normal. Thank you, Lara, once again. It was great.